Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bominable Bominations, a podcast serializing turn-of-the-century horror hosted and read by me, Thomas Barker. This week I bring to you The Thrilling Conclusion of the Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. Part 2. 6. The Dunwich Horror itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Waitley's grotesque trip to Cambridge and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. Early in August, the half-expected outcome developed and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued, always in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then... There rang out a scream from a wholly different throat. Such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward. Such a scream as could come from no being born of Earth, or wholly of Earth. Armitage hastened into some clothing and rushed across the street and lawn to the college buildings, saw that others were ahead of him, and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window showed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming now fast faded into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see, so he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others, he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, except for a watchful, droning whine from the dog had by this time quite subsided, but Armitage now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breath of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench, which Dr. Armitage knew too well and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second, nobody dared to turn on the light. Then, Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it is not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among disordered tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side, in a fetid pool of green-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness, was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room, and just inside the window, an empty canvas sack lay where it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk, a revolver had fallen, a dented but undischarged cartridge, later explaining why it had not been fired. The thing itself, however, 
crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, with very man-like hands and head, and the goatish, chinless face had the stamp of the Waitleys upon it. But the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous, so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist, it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully, had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off, and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long, greenish-gray tentacles with red, sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd, and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. On each of the hips, deep set in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was what seemed to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians and terminated in ridgy-veined pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color, as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles, this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance, which alternated with a sickly grayish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none, only the fetid, greenish-yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of the stickiness and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, it began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first, the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth, but toward the last there came some disjointed fragments evidently taken from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. Those fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like, Nigai, nga, nga, buch, shoko. Yeah, yog sotot, yog sotot, yog sotot. They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised its head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the window, the shrieking of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of a panic-struck whirring and fluttering, 
Against the moon, vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. All at once, the dog started up abruptly, gave a frightened bark, and leapt nervously out the window by which it had entered. A cry rose from the crowd, and Dr. Armitage shouted to the men outside that no one must be admitted till the police or medical examiner came. He was thankful that the windows were just too high to permit of peering in, and drew the dark curtains carefully down over each one. By this time, two policemen had arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the vestibule, was urging them for their own sakes to postpone entrance to the stench-filled reading room till the examiner came, and the prostrate thing could be covered up. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice, But it is permissible to say that, aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human elements in Wilbur Waitley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky, whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently, Waitley had had no skull or bony skeleton at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. 7. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Waitley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging, lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Waitley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome, boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress amongst the innumerable Waitleys, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters written in a huge ledger and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and the variations in ink and penmanship presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it on the old bureau which served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books, for study and possible translation. But even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and Old Waitley always paid their debts has yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. Up there in the rud beyond the glen, Miss Corey, they something been there. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rud like they'd been a house been moved along of it, and letting the wasp nether. These prints in the rud, Miss Corey, 
great round prints as big as barrel heads, all sunk down deep like an elephant had been along. Only there's a sight more nor four feet could make. I looked at one or two afore I run, and I see every one was covered with lines spreading out from one place, like as if big palm leaf fans, twicked or three times as big as any day is, had have been pounded down into the road, and the smell was awful, like what it is around Wizard Waitley's old house. Here he faltered, and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that had sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors, thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, the nearest place to Waitley's, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit. For Sally's boy Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Waitley's and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. Yes, Miss Corey, came Sally's tremulous voice over the party wire. Chauncey's just come back a postin', and he couldn't half talk for being scared. He says old Waitley's house is all blowed up, with the timbers scattered round like they'd been dynamite inside, only the bottom floor ain't through. It is all covered with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells awful and drips down off in the ages into the ground where the side timbers is blowed away. And these awful kind of marks in the yard, too. Great round marks, bigger round than a hog's head, and all sticky with stuff like is on the blowed-up house. Chauncey says they leads off into the matters, where a great swath wider in a barn is matted down and all the stone walls tumbled every which way wherever it goes. And he says, says he, Miss Corey, as how he got to look for Seth's cows, frightened as he was, and found him in the upper pasture, nigh the devil's hop yard in an awful shape. Half on him's clean gone, and nigh half on him that's left is sucked most dry of blood, with sores on him like there's been on Waitley's cattle ever since Lavinie's black brat was born. Seth, he's gone out now to look at him, though I'll vow he wouldn't care to get very nigh Wizard Waitley's. Chance he didn't look careful to see where the big matted down swath lit at or it left the pasturage, but he says he thinks it painted down towards the Glen Road to the village. I tell you, Miss Corey, there's something abroad as hadn't order be abroad, and I, for one, think that Black Wilbur Waitley has come to the bad end he deserved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He want all human himself. I allus says to everybody, and I think he and old Wheatley must have raised something in that there nailed-up house, as ain't even so human as he was. They's allus been unseen things around Dunwich, living things, as ain't human, and ain't good for human folks. The ground was a talkin' last night, and towards morning, Chauncey, he heard the whippoorwill so loud in Cold Spring Glen he couldn't sleep none. Then he found he heard another, faint-like sound over towards Wizard Waitley's, a kind of ripping or tearing a wood, like some big box or crate was been opened for off. What with this and that, he didn't get to sleep at all till sunup, and no sooner was he up this morning, but he's got to go over to Waitley's and see what's the matter. He see enough, I tell ye, Miss Corey, this didn't mean no good. And I think as all the men folks ought to get up a party and do something, I know something awful's about, and feel my time is nigh, though. Only God knows just what it is. Did your Luther take account of what them big tracks led to? No? Well, Miss Corey, if they was on the Glen Road this side of the Glen, and ain't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen itself. And they would do that. I allus says Cold Spring Glen ain't no healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creatures of God. And they's them as says ye can hear strange things, a rushing and a talking in the air down there, if ye stand in the right place, between the rock falls and bear's den. By that noon, Fully three-quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Waitley ruins and cold Spring Glen, examining in horror the vast, 
monstrous prints, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreckage of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great, sinister ravine. For all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetter. And it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue, rather than descend and beard the unknown Cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. That night, everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning, a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree, when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came, apparently, from the barn, and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dog slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew it would be death to go out into that black farmyard. The children and the womenfolk whimpered, kept from screaming by some obscure vestigial instinct of defense, which told them their lives depended on silence. At last... The noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, and a great snapping, crashing, and crackling ensued. The Fries, huddled together in the sitting room, did not dare to move until the last echoes died away far down in Cold Spring Glen. Then, Amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demoniac piping of late whippoorwills in the glen, Selina Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what news she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. Two Titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only about a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered about halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong, and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof. But, in general, there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before, and a futile 
ineffective gesture of loading muskets and setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred, except some hill noises, and when the day came there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. There were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down in the glen, though they did not venture to set an actual example to the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning, both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror, whilst the conformation of the tracks seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed shrubbery and saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost complete verticality. And as the investigators climbed around to the hill's summit by safer routes, they saw that the trail ended, or rather reversed, there. It was here that the Waitleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on May Eve and Hallow Mass. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space thrashed around by the mountainous horror, whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick, fetid deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Waitley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Only old Zebulon, who was not with the group, could have done justice to the situation or suggested a plausible explanation. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh! My God! And some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the Fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later, when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the Fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered, only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fries had been erased from Dunwich. 8. In the meantime, a quieter yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. The curious manuscript record or diary of Wilbur Waitley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, 
being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue. Even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatsoever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet. This one, of a very different caste, and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter, and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity in the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults, which have come down from old times, and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital, since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae and incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew, from the repeated failures of his colleagues, that the riddle was a deep and complex one, and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August, he fortified himself with the massed lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library, and wading night after night amidst the arcana of Trithemius Polygraphia, Giambattista Porta's De Furtivis Literarum Notis, De Visionaire's Trade de Chiffre, Falconer's Cryptomensis Petifacta, Davis and Thickness's 18th century treatises, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair, von Martin, and Kluber's Cryptographic. He interspersed his study of the books with attacks on the manuscript itself, and in time became convinced that he had to deal with one of those subtlest and most ingenious of cryptograms, in which many separate lists of corresponding letters are arranged like the multiplication table, and the message built up with arbitrary keywords known only to the initiated. The older authorities seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and Armitage concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times he seemed near daylight, only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, as September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged definitely and unmistakably, and it became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Waitley's annals. It was, in truth, a diary as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November 26, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half, who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today I learned the Aklo for the Sabaoth. It ran, which did not like, it being answerable from the hill and not from the air. That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. 
shot Elam Hutchins' collie Jack when he went to bite me, and Elam says he would kill me if he dust. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the Do formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off, if I can't break through with the Dohna formula when I commit it. They from the air told me at Sabbat that it will be two years before I can clear off the earth, and I guess Grandfather will be dead then, so I shall have to learn all the angles of the plains and all the formulas between the Ir and the Hningar. They from outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs looks like it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the Yurish sign or blow the power of Ibn Kazi at it, and it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared, and there are no earth beings on it. He that came with the Aklo Sabaot said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife he would not be home, and when she brought him a breakfast from the house, he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day he read on, now and then halted maddeningly as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the next night he drowsed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares, almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had uncovered. On the morning of September 4th, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing him for a while, and departed trembling and ashen gray. That evening he went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, he was back at the manuscript, and began to take copious notes both from the current sections and from those he had already deciphered. In the small hours of that night he slept a little in an easy chair in his office, but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Some time before noon his physician, Dr. Hartwell, came to see him and insisted that he cease work. He refused, intimating that it was of the utmost vital importance for him to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, he finished his terrible perusal and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state. But he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a great envelope, which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what, in God's name, can we do? Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. He made no explanations to Hartwell, but in his calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. His wilder wanderings were very startling indeed, including frantic appeals that something in a boarded-up farmhouse be destroyed, and fantastic references to some plan for the extirpation of the entire human race and all animal and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder race of beings from another dimension. He would shout that the world was in danger, since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen, vigintillions of eons ago.
At other times, he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Demona Latrea of Remigius, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Stop them! Stop them! he would shout. Those Waitleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death, and at that rate... But Armitage had a sound physique despite his 73 years, and he slept off his disorder that night without developing any real fever. He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober, with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference. And the rest of that day and evening, the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage, and diagrams and formulae were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Waitley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that, not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. Opinions were divided as to notifying the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample, as indeed was made clear during certain subsequent investigations. Late at night, the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan, but all Sunday, Armitage was busy comparing formulae and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Waitley had left behind him. The earth-threatening entity which, unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwich Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday with Dr. Armitage, for the task in hand required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of plan, and he knew that even in the end a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday he had a definite line of action mapped out, and believed he would try a trip to Dunwich within a week. Then on Wednesday the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a facetious little item from the Associated Press, telling what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwich had raised up. Armitage, half-stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the next day, they discussed, and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of them all. Armitage knew he would be meddling with terrible powers, yet saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before him. 9. Friday morning, Armitage, Rice, and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant, but even in the brightest sunlight, a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover about the strangely domed hills and the deep, shadowy ravines of the stricken region. Now and then, on some mountaintop, a gaunt circle of stones could be glimpsed against the sky. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, they knew something hideous had happened and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elmer Fry house and family. Throughout the afternoon, they rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred, and seeing for themselves with rising pangs of horror the drear Fry ruins with their lingering traces of the tarry stickiness, the blasphemous tracks in the Fry yard, the wounded Seth Bishop cattle, and the enormous swaths of disturbed vegetation in various places. The trail up and down Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost cataclysmic significance, 
and he looked long at the sinister, altar-like stone on the summit. At length, the visitors, apprised of a party of state police which had come from Aylesbury that morning, in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the Fry yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with the policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then, old Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. God, he gasped, I told them not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody'd do it with them tracks and that smell and the whippoorwills a screeching down there in the dark a noonday. A cold shudder ran through natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. Negotium per ambulans in tenebris, the old librarian rehearsed the formulae he had memorized and clutched the paper containing the alternative ones he had not memorized. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice, beside him, took from a valise a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big game rifle on which he relied, despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. Armitage, having read the hideous diary, knew painfully well what kind of a manifestation to expect, but he did not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. He hoped that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing it had escaped. As the shadows gathered, the natives commenced to disperse homeward, anxious to bar themselves indoors despite the present evidence that all human locks and bolts were useless before a force that could bend trees and crush houses when it chose. They shook their heads at the visitors' plan to stand guard at the Fry ruins near the glen, and as they left, had little expectancy of ever seeing the Watchers again. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while, a wind, sweeping up out of Cold Spring Glen, would bring a touch of ineffable fetter to the heavy night air, such a fetter as all three of the watchers had smelled once before, when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked-for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sounds ceased. It was a gray, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. The men from Arkham were undecided what to do, seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed Fry outbuildings they debated the wisdom of waiting, or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of their nameless, monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness, and distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered, and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand, as if descending into the accursed glen itself. The sky grew very dark, and the watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one, followed by clear weather. It was still gruesomely dark when, not much over an hour later, a confused babble of voices sounded down the road, 
Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen men, running, shouting, and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words, and the Arkham men started violently when those words developed a coherent form. Oh my god! Oh my god! The voice choked out. It's a gone again, and this time by day! It's out! It's out! And... A move in this very minute, and only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all. The speaker panted into silence, but another took up his message. Nigh on an hour ago, Zeb Waitley here heard the phone a ringing, and it was Miss Corey, George's wife that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was out driving in the cows from the storm out of the big bolt. When he sees all the trees abandoned at the mouth of the glen, opposite side to this, and smelt the same awful smell like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. And she says, he says, there was a swishing, lapping sound. More nor what the bending trees and bushes can make. And all on a sudden, the trees alongside the road begin to get pushed one side. And they was an awful stomping and splashing in the mud. But mind ye, Luther said he didn't see nothing at all. Only just the bending trees and underbrush. Then, for head where Bishop's Brook goes under the road, he heard an awful creaking and straining on the bridge, and says he could tell the sound of wood is starting to crack and, and split, and all the whiles he never seen a thing, only them trees and bushes abandoned. And when the swishing sound got very fur off on the road towards Wizard Waitley's and Sentinel Hill, Luther, he had the guts to step up where he heard it first and look at the ground. It was all mud and water, and the sky was dark, and the rain was wiping out all tracks about as fast as could be. But beginning at the glen mouth, where the tree's bed moved, they was still some of them awful prints, big as barrels, like he seen Monday. At this point, the first excited speaker interrupted. But that ain't the trouble now. That was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up, and everybody was a-listening in when the call from Seth Bishop's cut in. His housekeeper Sally was carrying on fit to kill. She just seed the trees abandoned beside the road, and says they was kind of mushy sound, like an elephant puffing and treading a-heading for the house. Then she up and spoke sudden of a fearful smell, and says her boy Chauncey was a screaming, is how it was just like what he smelt up to the Waitley ruins Monday morning. And the dogs was all barking and whining awful. And then she let out a terrible yell, and says the shed down the road had just caved in like the storm had blowed it over. Only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everybody was a-listening, and you could hear lots of folks on the wire a-gasping. All taunt Sally, she yelled again and says the front yard picket fence bed just crumpled up, though there wasn't no sign of what done it. Then everybody on the line could hear Chauncey, and old Seth Bishop a yelling too, and Sally was shrieking out that nothing heavy had struck the house, and Sally was shrieking out that something heavy had struck the house. Not lightning, not nothing, but something heavy again the front that keep a launching itself again and again, though you couldn't see nothing out the front windows. And then... And then, lines of fright deepened on every face, and Armitage, shaken as he was, had barely poise enough to prompt the speaker. And then, Sally, she yelled out, Oh, help! The house is a-caving in, and on the wire we could hear a terrible crashing and a whole flock a-screaming, just like when Elmer Fry's place was took. Only worse. The man paused, and another of the crowd spoke. That's all. Not a sound nor squeak over the phone after that. Just still like. We that heard it got about fords and wagons and rounded up as many able bodied men folks as we could get at Corey's place and come up here to see what you thought best to do. Not but what I think it's the Lord's judgment for our iniquities that no mortal can ever set aside. Armitage saw that the time for positive action had come and spoke decisively to the faltering group of frightened rustics. We must follow it, boys. He made his voice as reassuring as possible. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You men know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well, this thing is a thing of wizardry, and must be put down by the same means. 
I've seen Wilbur Waitley's diary and read some of the strange old books he used to read, and I think I know the right kind of a spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible, I knew it would be, but there's a powder in this long-distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on, we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world has escaped. Now we've only this one thing to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm, so we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. We must follow it, and the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I've an idea there might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? The men shuffled about a moment, and then Earl Sawyer spoke softly, pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across to the lower matter here, wading the brook at the low place, and climbing through carriers, mowing, and the timber lot beyond. That comes out in the upper robe mighty nice Seth's, a little t'other side. Armitage, with Rice and Morgan, started to walk in the direction indicated, and most of the natives followed slowly. The night was growing lighter, and there were signs that the storm had worn itself away. When Armitage inadvertently took a wrong direction, Joe Osborne warned him and walked ahead to show the right one. Courage and confidence were mounting, though the twilight of the almost perpendicular wooded hill which lay toward the end of their shortcut, and among whose fantastic ancient trees they had to scramble as if up a ladder, put these qualities to a severe test. At length they emerged on a muddy road to find the sun coming out. They were a little beyond the Seth Bishop place, but bent trees and hideously unmistakable tracks showed what had passed by. Only a few moments were consumed in surveying the ruins just around the bend. It was the Fry incident all over again, and nothing, dead or living, was found in either of the collapsed shells which had been the bishop house and barn. No one cared to remain there amidst the stench and the tarry stickiness, but all turned instinctively to the line of horrible prints leading on toward the wrecked Waitley farmhouse and the altar-crowned slopes of Sentinel Hill. As the men passed the site of Wilbur Waitley's abode, they shuddered visibly, and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but that had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road, and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. Armitage produced a pocket telescope of considerable power and scanned the steep green side of the hill. Then he handed the instrument to Morgan, whose sight was keener. After a moment of gazing, Morgan cried out sharply, passing the glass to Earl Sawyer and indicating a certain spot on the slope with his finger. Sawyer, as clumsy as most non-users of optical devices are, fumbled a while but eventually focused the lenses with Armitage's aid. When he did so, his cry was less restrained than Morgan's had been. God Almighty! The grass and bushes is a-movin'. It's a-goin' up, slow-like, creepin' up to the top this minute, heaven only knows what for. Then the germ of panic seemed to spread among the seekers. It was one thing to chase the nameless entity, but quite another to find it. Spells might be all right, but suppose they weren't. Voices began questioning Armitage about what he knew of the thing, and no reply seemed quite to satisfy. Everyone seemed to feel himself in close proximity to phases of nature and of being utterly forbidden and wholly outside the sane experience of mankind. 10. In the end... The three men from Arkham, old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, 
Stocky, iron-gray Professor Rice and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained in the road, and as they climbed they were watched closely by those among whom the glass was passed around. It was hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the toiling group, the great swath trembled as its hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Waitley, of the Undecayed branch, was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. This indeed proved to be true, and the party were seen to gain the minor elevation only a short time after the invisible blasphemy had passed it. Then Wesley Corey, who had taken the glass, cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held, and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that the sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three men shut their eyes, but Curtis Waitley snatched back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice, from the party's point of vantage above and behind the entity, had an excellent chance of spreading the potent powder with marvelous effect. Those without the telescope saw only an instant's flash of gray cloud, a cloud about the size of a moderately large building near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who had held the instrument, dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumpled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan half inaudibly. Oh, oh, great God, that, that, oh, great God, that, that. There was a pandemonium of questioning, and only Henry Wheeler thought to rescue the fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was past all coherence, and even isolated replies were almost too much for him. Bigger in a barn, all made of squirming ropes, all things sort of shaped like a, like a hen's egg, bigger than anything, with dozens of legs like hogsheads that half shut up when they step. Nothing solid about it. All like chili, and made of separate wriggling ropes pushed close together. Great bulging eyes all over it. Ten or twenty mouths or trunks are sticking about all along the sides. Big as stovepipes and all a tossin' and openin' and shutting, all gray, with kind of blue or purple rings. And God in heaven, that half-face on top. This final memory, whatever it was, proved too much for poor Curtis, and he collapsed completely before he could say more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him on the damp grass. Henry Wheeler, trembling, turned the rescued telescope on the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses were discernible three tiny figures, apparently running toward the summit as fast as the steep incline allowed. Only these. Nothing more. Then everyone noticed a strangely unseasonable noise in the deep valley behind, and even in the underbrush of Sentinel Hill itself. It was the piping of unnumbered whippoorwills, and in their shrill chorus there seemed to lurk a note of tense and evil expectancy. Earl Sawyer now took the telescope and reported the three figures as standing on the topmost ridge, virtually level with the altar stone, but at a considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be raising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals. And as Sawyer mentioned the circumstance, the crowd seemed to hear a faint 
half-musical sound from the distance, as if a loud chant were accompanying the gestures. The weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite grotesqueness and impressiveness, but no observer was in a mood for aesthetic appreciation. I guess he's saying the spell, whispered Wheeler as he snatched back the telescope. The whippoorwills were piping wildly, and in a singularly curious, irregular rhythm quite unlike that of the visible ritual. Suddenly, the sunshine seemed to lessen without the intervention of any discernible cloud. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, and was plainly marked by all. A rumbling sound seemed brewing beneath the hills, mixed strangely with a concordant rumbling which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, and the wondering crowd looked in vain for the portents of storm. The chanting of the men from Arkham now became unmistakable, and Wheeler saw through the glass that they were all raising their arms in the rhythmic incantation. From some farmhouse far away came the frantic barking of dogs. The change in the quality of the daylight increased, and the crowd gazed about the horizon in wonder. A purplish darkness, born of nothing more than a spectral deepening of the sky's blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. Then the lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before, and the crowd fancied that it had showed a certain mistiness around the altar stone on the distant height. No one, however, had been using the telescope at that instant. The whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation, and the men of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which will never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather would one have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It is almost erroneous to call them sounds at all, since so much of their ghostly, infrabase timbre spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so since their form was indisputably, though vaguely, that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed, yet did they come from no visible being. And because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer, and winced, as if in expectation of a blow. Kling-ya! Kling-ya! Ftar-kling-kya-mka! Ftar-kling-kya-mka! Yog-so-toth! rang the hideous croaking out of space. Lim-ben-kling-kya! Ngrach-ngel-la! The speaking impulse seemed to falter here, as if some frightful psychic struggle were going on. Henry Wheeler strained his eye at the telescope, but saw only the three grotesquely silhouetted human figures on the peak, all moving their arms furiously in strange gestures as their incantation drew near its culmination. From what black wells of acherontic fear or feeling, from what unplumbed gulfs of extracosmic consciousness or obscure, long-latent heredity were those half-articulate thunder croakings drawn. Presently, they began to gather renewed force and coherence as they grew in stark, utter, ultimate frenzy. <laughs> Help! Help! Father! Father! But that was all. The pallid group in the road, still reeling at the... (sighs) 
indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills, the deafening, cataclysmic peal whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hearer was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. Trees, grass, and underbrush were whipped into a fury, and the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal fetter that seemed about to asphyxiate them, were almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance, green grass and foliage wilted to a curious, sickly yellow-gray, and over field and forest were scattered the bodies of dead whippoorwills. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day, there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Waitley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain in the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet, and seemed shaken by memories and reflections even more terrible than those which had reduced the group of natives to a state of cowed quivering. In reply to a jumble of questions, they only shook their heads and reaffirmed one vital fact. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of, and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe. Some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence, and in that pause the scattered senses of poor Curtis Waitley began to knit back into a sort of continuity, so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh, oh my God, that half-face, that half-face on top of it, that face with the, the red eyes and crinkly albino hair, and no chin like the Waitley's. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing, but there was a half-shaped man's face on top of it. And it looked like Wizard Waitley's. Only it was yards and yards across. He paused, exhausted, as the whole group of natives stared in a bewilderment not quite crystallized into fresh terror. Only old Zebulon Waitley, who wanderingly remembered ancient things, but who had been silent heretofore, spoke aloud. Fifteen year gone, he rambled. I heard old Waitley say as how some day we'd hear a child of Lavinia's uh, calling its father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to question the Arkan men anew. What was it, anyhow? And however did young Wizard Waitley call it out the air it come from? Armitage chose his words carefully. It was. Well... It was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside, and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. 
I'm going to burn his accursed diary. And if you men are wise, you'll dynamite that altar stone up there and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Waitleys were so fond of, the beings they were going to let in tangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to the thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big. But it beat him because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. You needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother. But it looked more like the father than he did. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Bominable Bominations and the conclusion of H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror. Tune in next week for another exciting episode and serialization of a tale of horror from the turn of the 20th century. If you enjoyed this tale of eldritch madness, please feel free to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications. The most mysterious alchemy of all. Questions, queries, or comments? You can email me at t-u-o-m-a-s-v-a at outlook.com. Take care and stay safe. Bye for now.